This is a post from my Substack. Uh, the title of it is To Tweet or Not to Tweet and my constant battle with social media. So if you want to subscribe to the Substack, you can go to substack.com slash at Jordan B. Cooper. I'll put a link below. I uh, also just want to say I gave a talk related to this particular topic uh, that I will also link below to talk on the issue of connectivity and what it means to be connected to other human persons. As I'm finally getting around to reading Jonathan Haidt's Much to Praise the Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewriting of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness, I'm once again thinking about my own relationship to technology as a whole and to social media in particular. My feelings on such technologies have always been a bit mixed, as on the one hand, I've met some of my closest friends through social media platforms, but on the other, I've had some pretty terrible experiences by means of these same platforms. I also recognize that their use often leads to increased anxiety and a decreased possibility of having a coherent and rational discussion. In this article, I lay out some of my thoughts on these platforms and express why I think we need to pursue a better way forward. All right, why I began in the first place. Like all good millennials, I began my relationship with social media on MySpace during my later years in high school. I posted what limited pictures were allowed on the platform of myself with dyed black hair that I had straightened covering half of my face, tight jeans, and usually a children's extra large band t-shirt of one kind or another. Like many at that time, I really only had two reasons to use the platform. One, to find new bands to listen to, and two, to get attention from cute girls. Both of these things worked pretty well at the time, I suppose, though I can't say that the latter thing was the most virtuous use of the platform. But to be clear, no salacious pictures here. These were Christian punk and scene girls I was talking to. After MySpace stopped being a useful platform for music and my impeccable alt style and music taste helped me find my now wife, there was no longer any reason to use the platform really at all, and thus ended my relationship to social media. Or not. I pushed hard against using Facebook for a long time. I was annoyed about the fact that everyone kept talking about friending and poking people in college when we could simply talk to other people in person. I didn't get the point. As a bit of a curmudgeon and as one who hates to do things just because everyone else is doing it, I held off for a long time until I inevitably gave in after enough pestering from my friends. Though and I initially didn't understand its popularity, Facebook became useful when I began to join some theological groups and realized that there was some benefit here in having an opportunity to write and debate with similarly theologically interested people. Of these new online plat platforms and forms of communication that grew during the 2000s, the one that I was most drawn to was blogging. During college, I wrestled with a number of theological issues, which eventually led to my leaving the Reformed tradition for the Lutheran tradition. My blog spot page, titled Justin Sinner, became uh, an outlet to process these ideas through writing, though I actually began it before I uh, became a Lutheran. I never had any thought that these posts would actually be read by really anybody outside of my immediate circle of friends, but after only a few months of writing, it became apparent that I was wrong. During my undergraduate studies, I thought that I was going to pursue a degree in New Testament studies with a focus on Pauline soteriology. In preparation for that, I began an independent study on the new perspective on Paul, which was all the rage at the time, and wrote up some reviews of the books and thoughts of N.T. Wright, James Dunn, and E.P. Sanders for my blog. One day after posting a few of these, I noticed that I had received a new comment from a scholar who had actually worked in the field. And then about a week later, I had received one from another. I never had any thought that anyone other than my own roommates would be paying attention to what a 21-year-old college student was writing online, but contrary to these expectations, the audience began to steadily grow. Totally unintentionally, I had built an audience through an online platform. I began to realize, after my move to the Lutheran Church, that there were not an awful lot of resources online for Lutheran theology, especially ones that were aimed at those who were not themselves from a Lutheran background. Thus, I came to see some benefits in using the platform as a means to bring Lutheran theological resources into public view, since the new Calvinists had dominated these spheres of new online media. While I pursued my master's in theology, I continued to use this blog as a way to process my thoughts about various doctrinal topics, and I was asked to be a guest on a few different podcasts. It was also at this time when I had my first articles accepted for publication in theological journals. There was some growing visibility for my name, uh, which I initially had hoped would lead to a faculty position somewhere. 
After God moved me into the direction of pastoral ministry and I was called to my first parish, I initially planned on spending my non-ministry time in doctoral work. I had been accepted into a PhD program at the London School of Theology and was planning to continue my studies on the doctrine of justification in Paul and the patristics. However, I had also just had my first child, I moved my family across the country, and I began serving in full-time ministry. After listening to some much-needed wisdom from my wife, who would have supported whatever decision uh, I made, whatever I chose to do, I realized that adding a doctoral program to all, all of those new things was probably a bit too much. So this is when I decided to delay my pursuit of a PhD and to spend some time writing. Now, out of this time writing came my first three books, The Righteousness of One, Christification, and The Great Divide. And then I started a podcast. As I observed people moving away from written blogs toward podcasting, I thought that this might be another opportunity to bring a Lutheran theological voice into an area that was dominated by Calvinists. This would give me the opportunity to continue uh, to pursue the intellectual life while doing so in a way that did not have the same kind of pressures that a degree program would. Thus began the Just and Sinner podcast. Now, as the podcast grew, so did the interview appearances on other podcasts. In order to interact with others who were interested in the Lutheran Church, I began to look for platforms to do so other than Facebook and blog comments, which were becoming far less active at this time. I had a few videos on my YouTube channel, which had been initially created as a space to post yo-yoing videos, but the videos weren't a focus yet of Justin Sinner. After recommendations to do so from a number of other people, I decided to create a Twitter account. Uh, and out of this grew a small community, though I don't think such a thing even exists on the internet, but that's for another discussion. A uh, community of Lutherans who talked about theology, apologetics, and liturgy. I made some great friends through those initial couple of years, though it also led to some rather traumatic life experiences that I'd rather not revisit. Uh, so I can't say that the platform is entirely negative. In my initial online experiences, whether it was through blogging, uh, discussing things on Facebook or tweeting, these online forums were not these kind of ever-present realities that obscured my face-to-face -face interactions with the people around me. I refused the smartphone for years because I didn't want to develop an unhealthy relationship to technology. And I knew that such a thing would be inevitable if I did end up purchasing one. Those early online interactions discussed so far were had on a computer while I was sitting at my desk. And when I was away from my computer, I didn't think about it all that much. The one piece of technology that stayed with me throughout the day was my Kindle. But having Bruce McCormick's books on Karl Barth at my fingertips was not quite the temptation for instant gratification that could be found on a smartphone. In 2015, with much resistance, I finally gave in to the smartphone. When I became more focused on my ministry to college students, I realized that connectivity to those students uh, through platforms like Instagram was going to be a, a helpful tool to connect with them and know what was going on in their lives. Thus began the slow decline into the smartphone-fueled existence that we have nearly all faced since that time. There are a lot of things that changed with this move. One is that when the smartphone became dominant, it became a sudden expectation that everyone is reachable at all times for any reason. Any divide between work and life simply disappeared, as there was now an expectation of immediate communication constantly. No one ever really gets out of work mode into a mode of relaxation, as there is an ever-present stress of one's duties to respond no matter the hour. Another is that social media began to encapsulate one's socialization throughout the day, meaning that it structures how one thinks about their life from moment to moment. It extracts us from our present existence in actual time and space and places us into this ethereal realm of pseudo-relationality. Now, in the last 10 years, things have increasingly gotten worse. Uh, the forums that used to be means of theological discussion were overtaken by arguments about politics. And not the interesting things of politics, such as the uh, pre-political, philosophical, and theological ideas that undergird public life, the relevance of classical Christian texts like Augustine's The City of God for the Modern Day, or uh, the anthropological conception of rights and its post-Lockean framework in conversation with pre-modern Christian views of the individual and his relationship to the state. 
Instead, it's become accusations that a cabal of powerful Jews is controlling the weather, uh, complaining that there are too many people of Indian descent in the U.S., or pretending that Adolf Hitler was anything less than a demon under the guise of a human being. There's a process of dehumanization which has progressed through forums like Twitter or X, Reddit, and others. When we're divorced from actual communities in which we know one another and in which we actually know people as people rather than ideas or slogans, we gradually begin to see the opposition to our side as less like a fellow human being and more like a set of ideas that we oppose. I'm convinced that the amount of time that we have spent in these forums has distorted all of us so that we have essentially reprogrammed the way that we think about people as they are viewed in the same way that we view other information. And people are presences, not information. For this reason, we simply discard them or treat them like an idea or an object. In short, I have come to the conclusion at this point that interacting with people on the internet through public forums is deeply unchristian because it is deeply unhuman. Now, I'm not speaking about private one-on-one -on -one chats or group chats with friends, which I think work rather differently. This is not just an issue of one mode of interaction, such that this could simply be resolved if we regulated things a little bit more or if we spent just a little less time on these platforms. The problem is the platform. When the way in which we most commonly encounter others is not within the presence of individuals, but as elements of an algorithm to scroll past or like or dislike, we will always inevitably begin to categorize people as mere bits of information rather than persons. I don't think there's really any way around this problem. It has just taken us a while to see these effects, and now that we do, we have to make a choice. So what does that mean for me? I'm left in a bit of a precarious spot at the moment with all of this. I'm convinced that platforms like Substack or YouTube and podcasts are valuable in the way that books and articles and movies can be valuable. They allow for the creation of content that can be extensive and thoughtful and engaging. Most of social media, however, is not like that. It is for this reason that I am committed personally to leaving Twitter or X. But this is not quite so easy when my income comes through donations to a theological education organization that gives away and sells materials online. Now, to be clear, I have no issues with the use of the internet in the ways that we use things. We use it for things as an organization, which essentially boils down to one thing, really, delivering information. It's precisely what the internet is good for. Further, I am convinced that there is a deeper kind of knowing and recognition that is possible through the internet with Zoom and similar programs, though still not identical with that face-to-face in-person meeting, that differs very heavily from an algorithmically determined platform like Twitter or TikTok. This is because the former necessitates some actual attention being paid to the individual involved in the activity. The latter sees people and ideas as things to be scrolled past and swiped away by the very nature of the platform itself. The problem is that organizations like the one that I run, like Justin Sinner, need growth in order to survive, and that growth comes to some significant degree from social media marketing. And thus, I am stuck on Twitter for the time being. For the last year, I have had the goal in mind uh, that Justin Center would become financially stable enough that I would be able to leave social media behind altogether and spend my time simply on writing and speaking. Well, we're not quite there yet. We are getting closer. Uh, and so part of that plan is the reason why I started the Substack. And so if you would like to follow what I am thinking and what I am doing in the future, I do urge you to subscribe to the Substack and of course on the YouTube channel continually. Um, as these will be the only places that you'll be able to find uh, my writings on current discussions and events. And then I can leave the hellscape that is social media. Well, thanks so much for watching and make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. And also make sure you subscribe to the Substack. We'll see you in the next one. God bless.